Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. How good it is to be gathered together in worship this morning. I want to welcome you and say thank you and honor those veterans who are here among us on this Veterans Day weekend. It is an honor to be with you in worship this morning and so thank you so much for the sacrifice that you gave for the freedoms that we enjoy here in this country. There are a number of things going on in the life of our congregation. You can see a number of them on the back of your bullets, and I want to highlight a couple of them. First, spiritual practices for a simpler holiday. Holiday season is coming up, and if your holidays are at all like mine, it's not only the most wonderful time of the year, it's also the most hectic, frantic, crazy-making time of the year. Anybody else? So join in uh, today from noon until 2 o'clock with Jean Marie Tade, our pastoral resident, and Katie Smith, uh, Director of Parenting and Marriage Ministries. They'll be thinking about some spiritual practices to make the holidays a little bit less frantic, a little bit simpler. Also coming up, the Star Movie Night for our families on Thursday, November 16th. Kick off that frantic, wonderful holiday season by joining together and watching a great family-friendly movie. Also, uh, notice surviving the holidays. For those of us who have experienced loss in this past year or are in a season of grieving, join together to think about how we can still have a full uh, power and presence of God in the holiday season, even in the midst of the sadness we may be experiencing. I want to invite you now to stand as we call one another to worship this morning. It's printed in your bulletin. I'll read the regular parts, you join me in the bolded call to worship, okay? We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exult in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Fill our worship with grace, Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and deed may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Let's continue in worship.
your faithfulness extends to the skies. Your righteousness towers like the mountains. Your justice is deeper than the sea. All find protection under the shadow of your wings. We feast on the abundance you provide. You are the source of all life, and in your light we see light. Please be seated. Now is our time of the service that we confess our sins to the Lord. The psalmist models a transparent faith with these words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading by our own transparent confession. Join me in a moment of silence for, Lord, for the God, our Lord, to search our hearts and confess to him. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. For your name's sake, O Lord, Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. 
Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Friends in Christ, hear God's promise. I will sprinkle water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Church, let us proclaim what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall shout to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's take time now to bless our neighbors with the peace of Christ. Now, dear friends, would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we pause to give you thanks for gathering us here this morning by the power and in the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, would you open our eyes and our ears, would you soften our hearts? to your presence among us that we might be and even more so become your people because you have gathered us in worship this day. For those of us who are carrying heavy burdens, O oh Lord, would you remind us that your yoke is easy and that your burden is light. Would you help us be mindful of the burdens our neighbors may be carrying that we might join them in carrying those burdens with them trusting that as we follow Jesus, he leads and guides his church. For those of us who are carrying the weight of anxiety, would you beckon us, O oh Lord, to cast all our cares upon you, that you know us, that you hear us, and that you see what we're going through, that you are with us in the midst of whatever our life's journey has introduced this week. As we open your word in a few moments, O oh Lord, would you invite us 
to see the good news of the gospel in which we are able to put down roots into your faithfulness, into the soil of your goodness, that we might live lives of fruitfulness as a response. Would you use Pastor Emmanuel's words to meet us each where we are, that we might be beckoned forward into a life of faith? And would you allow us to hear what you would have for us to hear? hearing not only his words, but yours indeed, O God. Father, we give you thanks for this time. We give you thanks for the opportunity to be together. And we ask that you would continue to be with us by the power and presence of your spirit. Amen. Throughout the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, we see the symbol of water as central to the covenant life of God's people. We read that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of creation, that God's people passed through the Red Sea after their liberation from Egypt, that they crossed through the waters of the Jordan River as they entered into the Promised Land. These seasons of God's faithfulness were all recalled when John the Baptist was baptizing out at the Jordan River in preparation for the good news of Jesus, the Messiah's arrival. And so as we come to the waters of baptism this morning, we again remember God's good creation, liberation from sin through Jesus Christ, and the ongoing sanctification of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. These waters of baptism symbolize the covenant sign of God's freedom from sin, and unity with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. From the beginning, God has graciously included our children in his covenant of faith. All of God's promises are for all of God's people, including our little ones. Amen? Amen. As such, we are to teach them how they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children, that as they grow older, they may respond to him in personal faith and in commitment. Today we have the privilege of having two families bring forward their children for baptism. And so as we witness this sacrament this morning, may we also be reminded of our own baptisms and the life that we have been called to lead in Jesus. Since you have presented your children for baptism this morning, I'll pause to ask you these questions. You may respond in unison uh, before God and his people. Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust him? Do you promise to turn from the ways of the world to renounce sin and the powers of evil in the world? Do you intend for your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Baptism is a public declaration of God's goodness to his entire covenantal family. And as the first Presbyterian, he is agreeing with me. As the first Presbyterian church family, we have an essential role to play 
in the discipleship of these little ones that you see before you this morning. And so, one of our elders, Alicia, will lead us in a charge to the congregation. Please stand for the congregational charge. (laughs) Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. Do you, as covenant partners of First Presbyterian Church and Christ's global church, promise to guide and nurture all whom we baptize and their families by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his covenant community. Do you? Please be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, today we rejoice in your grace to your people. We give you thanks for this sign that points beyond itself to your covenantal faithfulness through the generations. We know that you make this water holy, and in your mighty power you set aside this water as a sign and a seal of redemption and rebirth. And so may these waters serve as a sign of witness to unite and to equip your church for faithful witness to the world that needs to know your saving love, grace, and joy. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I'll invite the Odoms to come forward and introduce your family and Bible verse. We're the Odoms. Um, I'm Blake. This is Blake Turner Odom Jr. We call him Turner. This is my wife, Ashlyn. And uh, I chose Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. There's one body and one spirit just as you were called by the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Okay. Can I try to take Turner? Let's see how this goes. It's been a little while. I'm a little out of practice. Good morning. How are you? How are you, Turner? See everybody out there? These are all your brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles in the family of God. Now I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, Diamonds, would you introduce your family and share your verse? Hi, I'm Jane Diamond. This is my husband, Graham, and our son, Caden. And the verse that we're going to share is from Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the right fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. We're pushing nap times. <laughs> what do you think, Graham? Should you hang on to him? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> So one one thing that we now know about Caden is he is a good judge of character. (laughs) It's the California, oh no. Okay, you stay right there with mom, okay? Yep. Caden, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you join me in prayer? Ever-living God, in your mercy, you promise to not only be our God, but also to be the God of our children. And so we thank you, especially this morning, for receiving Caden and Turner by baptism. Keep them always in your love. Guide them as they grow in faith. Protect them in all the dangers and temptations of life. And bring them to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And be his faithful disciples to their life's end. And we lift up their parents, Graham and Jane, Blake and Ashland. Give them wisdom and patience to guide Caden and Blake in the way of Jesus Christ and in the faith of the church. Let your peace and your joy dwell in their homes, that their families' lives may be instructed by faith, sustained by prayer, 
and governed by love. Strengthen them in their own baptism that they may rejoice as children of God and serve you faithfully in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you join me in welcoming these little ones to a life of faith? Thank you. Hey, buddy. And now I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings that go to the work of God here in this church, in our community, and around the world. Let's continue in worship.
He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, tenderness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. The same bringeth forth much fruit. Turn to the scriptures this morning and invite us to hear from the word which Emmanuel will be preaching on in a few moments. Because as you may have noticed, he's not here yet. <laughs> but I invite you to take a deep breath. I have heard the sermon, and it's quite good. <laughs> so waiting for a few moments will be just fine. Hear these words the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by one another. So, I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Curtis. So last summer, my lovely wife Rachel and I went for a trip to India, uh, which is where I grew up. And the last time I had been to India was was before the pandemic. So I had forgotten certain things about how life in India was. And one of those was that when you go to grocery stores in India, the aisle for ice creams is very short. And so after being there, I was sitting there thinking, when can I get my Bluebell Vanilla ice cream? <laughs> Which is the best flavor of ice cream in the world. And if you disagree with me, what can I say? <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> so I'm in India waiting to come back to the land of the free and the home of the brave so that I can walk down H-E-B ice cream aisle and pick the best flavor of ice cream I want. But here's the thing. As I'm enjoying the freedom of the ice cream here, I also become a prisoner of my paunch. You see, the point is, having freedom is good. But if you don't know how to use that freedom well, you may become a prisoner of the choices you make. Rollo May is a psychologist. He said, 
In the medieval times, we all had kings and queens and aristocracy that were above us. And in the name of freedom, we got emancipated from them, which is a good thing. But the problem is in modernity, we, in, we, we got freedom, but then we became prisoners of public opinion. Keeping up with the Joneses. When will I get to be the star of the month employee in my company? Being the perfect Insta mom on social media. So the point is, using your freedom is good. But at the same time, if we don't know how to use freedom for its intended purposes, we will end up becoming a prisoner of a choice. So in the passage that Pastor God has read in Galatians 5, Paul is talking about the right use of freedom. In verse 13 and 14, he says, the point of freedom is love. To love people humbly. That is the point of freedom. Harvard psychologists did a long-term study in which they studied 700 people from the age, for over 70 years, from when they were young till they passed away. And the biggest question they asked is this, what makes people happy? And the answer wasn't money. The answer wasn't social status. The answer was people that had loving relationships. That was the one thing that made people happy. Why is that? It's because we as human beings are made in the image of a loving God. We worship the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who love each other so much, and creation came out of being of that love. That is why the point of God giving us freedom is to use it to love people well. That is where we would be operating according to our design. But here's the problem. Paul says there are certain things that get in the way of our exercise of this freedom towards love. He calls them desires of the flesh. And in verses 19 to 21, he names 15 desires of the flesh. And five of those desires are normally what could be categorized as desires for uh, self-gratification. Our desire for self-gratification can get in the way of our loving people well. A great example of this is in uh, Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment. There is a character in Crime and Punishment called Marmeladov. Marmeladov is a drunk. He takes money from his wife, takes money from his children, goes to a bar and gets drunk when his children have nothing to eat. He, Marmeladov, using his freedom for his own self-gratification, gets in the way of his love for his family. It gets in the way of him being a good father or a good husband. And in many ways, Dostoevsky wrote himself into this character called Marmeladov. Because Dostoevsky would make a lot of money with books, and then he would go and gamble all the money he made or drink all the money off. off. And once he's run out of money, he'll write the next great novel, make a whole bunch of money, and repeat the whole cycle. And in fact, when he died, he left his wife destitute. You see, our flesh desires, when we use our freedom towards self-gratification, that can get in the way of us loving people well. So that's five of the 15 he names. And then there is another 10 desires of the flesh, which broadly fall under the category of self-promotion, idolatry and witchcraft, which is a kind of a Faustian bargain, if you will, of giving something up for the sake of getting ahead in life. And then he's got eight, which are envy, selfish ambition, 
dissension, which is how we engage with the fellow people around us for the sake, for the singular purpose of self-promotion within the community. And even that gets in the way of love. A great example of this is the great Gatsby. Jay Gatsby is a self-made man. He's built his fortune and is living in West Egg, and he throws all these huge, lavish parties as a way of self-promoting himself. For what reason? To find love. He's hoping that Daisy would one day walk into his party, see how great he is, and fall in love with him. But what happens in the novel? He dies a lonely man. Sorry if I gave off the ending. <laughs> but the point is, what he realized is when he used self-promotion as a way of finding love, what he found was other people that were good at self-promotion, but bad at love. You see, when we use our freedom as a way of self-gratification or self-promotion, it gets in the way of the point of freedom, which is love. So the question is, how do we live into, those, into the goal of being a loving person? Paul answers that by giving a list of nine spiritual fruits in verses 22 and 23. And theologians categorize these nine fruits as three triads. Love, joy, and peace. These are habits of the heart. They are internal dispositions that color how we perceive the world and also shape how we show up in the world. And then there is a second category of three, which is patience, kindness, and goodness, which is how we relate with other people in our community. And then there is the third category of the three, which is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which has to do with our personal conduct. Here's the interesting part. Paul calls them the fruit of the Spirit. The word fruit is important because if you look at a plant, when it produces fruit, does it produce fruit by just sheer self-will or self-effort? No, it does not. How do I know that? I watched some YouTube videos on how plants produce fruit. So plants need three things to produce good fruit. Soil that has nutrients, water, and then sunlight. If you give all three, the plant will automatically produce good fruit. And here Paul is saying, for us to have the fruit of the Spirit, we too need three ingredients. And the first one is, in verse 24, he says, we need to remember that we belong to Christ. We need to remember that we belong to Christ. This goes to our sense of identity. How do we see ourselves? You see, our belonging in Christ as a child of God is not something we earned with our self-effort. It was given to us because God is eternally faithful to us. Now, why is this important to not focus on our self-effort? Because if we focus on our self-effort, we miss the part about the relationship with God and how the relationship creates the fruit. Let me explain it with an example of why a relationship with God is the one that helps create the fruit of the Spirit. So growing up as a kid, in certain circles, I was an, ex an excluded kid. I looked at these kids and said, what is it? Why is it that these kids don't like me? And I told myself, well, maybe these, these kids don't like me because I'm not funny enough. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to become smart so even if you don't like me, you'll need me. <laughs> and being, in, being an Indian, I did the typical Indian thing to do, which is to go into software. <laughs> I 
And if you're trying to be the smart guy in the world of software, you win. And I had a successful career. All of it was based on building this identity as the smart guy. But here's the problem. Let's say I'm in a meeting trying to be the smart guy in the room, and there is another guy or a girl who's actually smarter than me, then what happens? My identity is threatened. Now I'm no longer the smart guy. So when my identity feels threatened, what happens to me? My anxiety goes up. So when I would go back home after a meeting like that, where my sense of identity as a smart guy got squashed, what would I do? I would do one of two things. Go to the refrigerator, open and get what? Bluebell vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and eat it as a way of assuaging this internal pain I was feeling. Finding relief in Bluebell. Or I would go on the side of self-promotion. Guess what? How many books do I need to read to again regain the smart guy status? I'll do whatever I need to do. Do I need to read books? Do I need to analyze code? I'll do whatever I need to do to again get back to the meeting and be the smart guy. And that's what I did. I mean, depending on the day, right? It was either Bluebell or books. <laughs> Self-gratification or self-promotion. It was only when I went to seminary, God showed me so much of my identity was just built on being the smart guy. And God showed me that my true identity was not that. My true identity was being the beloved of God. And it took me a while to really internalize that sense of identity that I am the beloved of God. God loves me in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit so much that what other people think about me does not matter. Now, here's the important piece. When I internalized the sense of being the beloved of God, guess what happened? It changed how I saw other people. I didn't see other people as a threat to my identity. Rather, I saw them as children who are beloved of God, who deserved my love as God loved me. You see, that is love as the fruit of the Spirit. It did not come by my self-effort. If I were to sit there and say, ooh, I, I'm a good Christian, so I need to love these people, that would not have been pure love. It is only when I experience God's unconditional love to me because of His faithfulness in spite of my unfaithfulness, am I then able to become a channel of God's love to other people? You see, this is love created as the fruit of the Spirit, not by self-effort. And then there is joy. Someone may look at somebody like Tony Robinson and say, you wake up in the morning, look at the mirror and say, I'm blessed 10 times and then you'll be happy. That's not the kind of joy that Paul is talking about here. The joy as the fruit of the Spirit is the living God loves you and His presence is with you. And it is that presence that brings joy as the fruit of the Spirit. And then peace as the fruit of the Spirit is not based on how much money I have in my 401k account. Rather, peace as the fruit of the Spirit says, hey, no matter what happens to me, I'll be fine because God is with me. God's loving presence is sufficient. You see, that is how the fruit of the Spirit comes not from self-effort, but from the relationship we have with God by being in God's presence. So the question is, how do we become people that are living in God's presence this way? You see, the presence of the Holy Spirit is always with us. It's only our ability to pay attention to the presence of the Holy Spirit goes up or down based on what's going on in our life. And Paul says, 
Paul gives the answer to that with the second ingredient. The first ingredient is you belong to Christ. And the second ingredient is crucify the desire of the flesh in verse 24. So what does it mean to crucify the desire of the flesh? Let me give you a quick example. So how do I crucify my desire for vanilla bluebell ice cream? I only buy this size. <laughs> Never a top. I try to eat it over, over a week. Sometimes it's more three, four days, but... You see, when Paul is saying crucify desires of the flesh, he's not saying deny all desire. No. God has put desires in us for us to be human beings that love each other and love beauty and goodness and truth. Desire is good. The word that Paul uses here for desire is epithumia, which means inordinate desire. It is over-desire. Desiring a good thing too much becomes over-desire. And when we are in that place of over-desiring something, it is hard for us to pay attention to God's Spirit and what He may be prompting us to. So how do we know that we are in this place of inordinate desire? And that brings us to the third ingredient that Paul talks about in verse 25, where he says, keep in step with the Spirit. What does the sense of keeping in step with the Spirit look like? Let's say I have a day when I'm frustrated about something. I'm worried, I'm anxious, something, right? I come home, my wife and I have dinner, and then I want to satisfy my sweet tooth, so what do I do? Get some bluebell ice cream. Get a scoop, eat it, and then I'm like, hey, maybe I need another scoop. I go get a second scoop, eat it, and then I'm still like, hey, maybe I need a third scoop. Instead of mindlessly going to the fridge and getting a third scoop, stopping and asking, hey, maybe this is not about bluebell ice cream. Maybe there is something else going on in me. Maybe there is something that's making me anxious, afraid, or frustrated, and I'm trying to kind of use bluebell ice cream as a form of therapy to hide or avoid that internal pain. You see, that is keeping in step with the Spirit, to stop and say, Father, what is going on here? You see, when I do that, that gives me the opportunity to bring the real thing beneath the thing to prayer, to God, to the Holy Spirit, and say, hey, this is making me anxious. What do you have to say about this? And when that happens, it strengthens my relationship with God. I become more attentive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And then I get, get a chance to talk about it with my wife, which strengthens the love that we both have. You see, instead of going into using my freedom to go into the self-gratification route to assuage my pain, going into the way of love, and then the gift of self-control comes. I didn't sit there and say, well, I can't have more than two scoops. I stopped. No. That will co would completely miss the point while still getting self-control. Self-control as a gift of the Spirit is by us keeping in step with the Spirit in our life. You see, this is why it is a relationship with God, a relationship with the Holy Spirit that creates the fruit. So in this passage, what God is ultimately calling us to is one reminding us that the freedom that He has won for us in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit it's not for us to use it for our own self-gratification or self-promotion, but rather for love. And the way we do that is, one, remembering that we are the beloved of God, crucifying any inordinate desires that we have, and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit so that we are attentive to the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that deepens our relationship with God and also with our loved ones. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The task, task of preaching is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And it's tough for a sermon to do both those things. Sometimes we feel afflicted and other times we feel comfortable. In your words to us this morning, Emmanuel, I feel both very deeply. Comforted by the good news of God's love for us and yet challenged by that third scoop of ice cream. For me, it happens to be mint chocolate chip. (laughs) Before we come to the table this morning, before we celebrate communion, the reminder of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf to show the love of God that empowers us, I want to invite our year's clerk of session, Michael Harada, to share with us on uh, this year's theme of stewardship here for the gospel and here for Houston. My apologies that we're a little bit out of order this morning. Yes, apologies that I was not able to walk quickly enough from the other side over here, but here we are. Hello, friends and family. Uh, As Pastor said, my name is Michael Harada, and I am your current clerk of session. I was asked to speak to you today about our current pledge campaign, Here for the Gospel, here for Houston, which is designed to cover the calendar year of 2024. I will be frank and admit that when they asked me to do this, I was a little bit more than hesitant. Uh, And the reason is that I myself absolutely hate to make pledges. And I thought it would be a little bit hypocritical of me uh, hating pledges to come and then ask you to make pledges. So, uh, I felt a little bit awkward about it, but I am here nonetheless to do exactly that. Let me explain just a little bit about why I have come to hate pledges, and and here it is. Uh, It's at least partly because in the past I have found myself in an awkward position of not being able to provide or fulfill the pledge that my wife and I made. This was many years ago. I was working then as a mid-level manager in information technology, and when an economic downturn caused the company that I worked for to have a mild panic, they felt that it it was compelling to them to, to trim the fat, and unfortunately, my job was part of the fat. Uh, So I was left without work. I I tried very diligently to find another job, but the market at the time was very competitive, and even though I assured my would-be employers that I was willing to take any job uh, at any level uh, with any salary, they took one look at that past salary that I had made, and they were certain that I would not remain satisfied with anything less for very long. While I continued to look for jobs in my field, I took odd jobs so that I could stay afloat. Had to pay the bill somehow. I cleaned carpets for a while, which was a back-breaking job, and everyone that I worked with doing it hated it just as much as I did. After that, I got a job for a while in a bakery, which was better, was still back-breaking work, but The advantage was that I could start work at 3 o'clock in the morning, work my eight hours, and still have enough time to go and look for work in IT. While I was first at the bakery, I was taught how to measure ingredients correctly. Um, We used scoops for every different ingredient, different scoop for every ingredient, and I've got a prop. The scoops that we used were much bigger than this, but my boss told me, look, you don't just scoop and put it in the mixing bowl. No, you take the scoop, you smack it once hard. What that does is it takes all the little bits that are still left in there and it puts them down on the bottom of the scoop. That way the scoop can move freely through the ingredient that you're trying to measure. Then take your scoop, And once you get it, you tap it lightly three times. What that does is it settles the ingredients down into the cup so you're getting an accurate measure. Then you look, you make sure that the measure is correct, and only then do you put it into the mixing bowl. 
what they told me was this. Good measurements based upon good recipes make good cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls is what I was baking at the time. Some of you may have heard a scripture reference in what I just described. It's from Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and it says this, Give, and it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and that will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will then be measured to you. Brothers and sisters, God is calling each of us to live generously without clinging to what he has put into our hands. God will never require from you what he is unable to provide to you. Unfortunately, in my story, I wasn't able to meet my pledge, and I was embarrassed by it. But guess what? There was no pledge police hauling me off to prison. No one even questioned what I gave or why I didn't meet the expectation. Pam and I were blessed mightily in the midst of our need until we again found ourselves blessed into abundance. Here at First Presbyterian Church of Houston, we use your pledges to form our budget. We don't want to misuse what you so generously give in worship to our God. So your session, your staff, and your pastors work diligently and even stringently to budget appropriately. But we simply cannot do that without your pledges. So, if, like me, you have not filled out a pledge yet, today is the last day for you to do one with this form. You can find them in your pews. You can find them in the narthex. And I encourage you, if you have not made your pledge for next year, to take the time and fill this out and turn it in either at, well, I guess in the back. Um, And, you know, my wife and I filled out a pledge card last night, and we're turning it in today, even though, as I said, I don't really like doing that. It's really, really easy. Just fill in the card. It's very simple to fill out. And as I said, this is the last day that we're going to be taking these written forms. There is another way. You can go online. In the back of your bulletin, there's a QR code. If you use that QR code, it'll take you directly to the site online where you can make the pledge. Or you can simply at home go to our website, fbchouston.org, and find the place and make the pledge. It is uh, something that uh, I, I believe, even if you don't like it like me, it helps so much and we would appreciate it. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your generosity towards us. We know that in your goodness and in your grace, you have provided everything that we need that pertains to life and to godliness. I ask that you would put it upon your people to do the thing that we need to do so that we can accurately budget. I thank you and praise you, Father, that those who have not pledged will do so, even if they're reticent like me. I thank you and praise you for your blessing, and I thank you, Father, that you are enough and more than enough. In Jesus' name. Before we're sent into the world to live our lives in the faith we have been reminded of this morning, I want to invite us to come forward to this table. And at this table, we remember the night that Jesus was betrayed and he was arrested. And he took bread, and as he broke it, he said, This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and pouring it out said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For this is my blood given for you. Jesus' body and Jesus' blood given for us that we might know of the forgiveness that we've been reminded of this morning and we might walk in the freedom 
of loving him and those he puts in our path. I'll invite our elders to come forward to receive the elements of communion and invite you to remain in your seats this morning as we receive the elements together. I will instruct you after a few moments, if you're able to hold the bread and hold on to the cup, we will take them together as a symbol of the unity that we have in our faith that we have confessed together this morning. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thank you. His kingdom. 
Let's take this together. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your goodness to us, for the soil in which we have been planted by the good news of the gospel, that we might grow roots down deep into that goodness. As we grow our roots down deep into the faithfulness of your love to us, we might live lives of fruitfulness and following after your Son, our Savior, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray, and in his name that we now join our voices together, echoing the prayer that he taught us as we sing now together. Would you now receive this blessing? Because of God's faithful t faithfulness to us through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are the beloved of God. Having been assured of God's love, let us go out and be a channel of God's love to a hurting and a broken world around us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. <laughs>